Back in December of 2019, IndieWire published an article with an opening line that stated, and I quote, The Mandalorian is a $100 million show about nothing. I will put a link in the description just in case you want to read the article yourself, but the gist of the write-up was that The Mandalorian was just kind of... there. It basically reads that episodes can be boiled down to shooting galleries held together by nothing but random celebrity cameos, animatronic cuteness, and weapons-grade nostalgia. The man behind the article, Tyler Hersko, ends his criticism with this closing paragraph. The last three episodes of The Mandalorian have been entirely interchangeable, and there's been zero plot developments to speak of since the titular protagonist escaped the Bounty Hunters Guild with Baby Yoda in tow in Episode 3. There's more than enough Star Wars locales for the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda to keep this unmoving jig up until the end of time, but one can only hope Season 1's remaining two episodes will provide some sort of long overdue catharsis to this meandering journey. Now, honest to god, even if you don't read the rest of the article, I think you can get a pretty good idea of Tyler's concerns and disappointments just from this last paragraph. The aspect that stood out to me the most was Tyler's focus on the sheer nothingness of the show. He complains of indistinct, meaningless, interchangeable episodes that don't lead to any plot progression aside from new locales to ogle at. And honestly, he's not wrong. The Mandalorian does not have a cast of deep, complex characters. The Mandalorian certainly does rely heavily on iconic pieces of Star Wars history. And honestly, The Mandalorian is pretty simplistic, if not glaringly straightforward with its writing and characters. Every gripe Tyler Hersko mentioned in his article is pretty reasonable or just flat out true. But that hasn't stopped a bunch of us from really liking this freaking show. Now, believe me, I will be the first person to point out the flaws in a narrative and its presentation. It's basically what I do 8 hours a day, 7 days a week. Finding the problems and irregularities in storytelling that might off-put some potential consumers is how I keep food on the table. And that's why I think this topic is so interesting, especially from a writing perspective. If The Mandalorian doesn't have interesting characters, interesting plot progression, or interesting stakes, what writing is being used to make the show interesting? Well, I think the answer to that honestly has to do way more with us as viewers rather than The Mandalorian as a piece of written art. Here's what I mean. If we take another look at the closing paragraph of Tyler Hersko's article, he talks about the interchangeability of The Mandalorian's episodes. Specifically, he mentions episodes 4, 5, and 6. This is important because it creates a distinction in enjoyment from episodes 1, 2, and 3. And of course, at the time, episodes 7 and 8 had not yet been released, and Tyler hoped those two episodes would provide a catharsis to what he considered a meandering journey. This is a ton of great information and allows us to get into the headspace of where Tyler and probably millions of other people were in terms of their satisfaction with the quality of the show. Now, looking at the contents of Episodes 1, 2, and 3, there is a pattern to recognize. Episode 1 introduces us to Mando and his mission to deliver Baby Yoda to a mysterious client. In Episode 2, we learn why Baby Yoda is so valuable, that being his connection to the Force. And in Episode 3, Mando decides to steal the baby away from the client, betray the Empire, and take Baby Yoda into his own care. All three of these episodes are linked by their connected stories. They set up a central plotline and build upon one another. No big problems so far. Episodes 4, 5, and 6 though is where the pace changes a bit and where Tyler starts to struggle. Episode 4 shows us Mando landing on the forest planet of Sorgan to help the locals fight off a smattering of raiders and an ATST. In Episode 5, Mando spends his time in a desert tracking down a bounty hunter. And in episode 6, we get the fresh comedic stylings of Space Bill Burr and the Island of Misfit Twi'Lex. Now, it does not take a whole lot of effort to notice the difference between these three episodes and the previous three episodes. Where episodes 1, 2, and 3 introduced us to a linear, ever-building narrative, episodes 4, 5, and 6 are, as Tyler said, completely interchangeable and nearly self-contained. It's a drastic shift in what amounts to the complete opposite narrative direction. 
And what's even stranger, episodes 7 and 8 put us back into the linear compounding storyline that was left off in episode 3. So what we appear to have here is a random three episode break that rips us away from the core story. Except that's not what happened at all. In fact, that's the opposite of what happened. These three seemingly random episodes are the core story and everything else is just there out of narrative necessity. Let's dive into that for a bit. When The Mandalorian was conceived and written by Jon Favreau, he didn't set out to write your typical Star Wars story. To put it more specifically, he wanted to avoid the space opera. If you've never heard that term before, don't worry, it's as weird as it sounds. A space opera is a subgenre of science fiction focusing on space warfare, melodramatic adventure, interplanetary battles, chivalric romance, and risk-taking. Sound familiar? Now, space operas have nothing to do with music, and the opera of it comes from the epic nature of the depicted narrative, meaning epic in scope and scale. Star Wars has for decades quite literally defined the space opera subgenre, and has effectively almost become synonymous with it. We fans of Star Wars expect there to be histrionic romances and screaming angst and impossibly high stakes. It kind of comes part and parcel with the territory now. But again, Jon Favreau didn't want that. He wanted to tread into a new territory with a Star Wars fiction. He wanted to avoid a space opera and tackle a space western. This is another subgenre of science fiction, but one that focuses on exploration, lawlessness, and defense of others who cannot defend themselves. Jon Favreau said he wanted to write a story about the scum and villainy of a post-imperial Star Wars galaxy. He was struck by what type of people and groups might survive in such a place before the New Republic established law and order. And if that sounds familiar, it's just the Wild West. All Jon Favreau did was put it in Star Wars. The Mandalorian takes huge inspiration from classic Western films, films that depict mysterious, sometimes nameless gunslingers traveling a vast frontier, righting the wrongs of communities they find, and in many cases, getting paid to do it. In fact, Clint Eastwood played that exact character archetype in a film titled, and I kid you not, Man With No Name. The adoration of classic westerns is so deep-seated that John Wayne's grandson is one of the actors that wears the Mandalorian suit when Pedro Pascal is not on set. But even though the Mandalorian is undeniably a space western, looking at classic western films is really only the first level of its inspiration. To truly discover the core of the subgenre that the Mandalorian has set itself in, we have to look at Japanese films. The Mandalorian um, is your iconically cool, flawed, mysterious, lone, you know, loner, gunslinger um, that harkens to the, you know, best of the samurai movies and the westerns. He's very, he's, he's, he's very his samurai uh, Clint and, uh, and me. <laughs> Believe it or not, American Western cowboy movies were based on Japanese samurai films, sometimes to the point of even being accused of plagiarism. Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name was nearly taken to court for being a one-to-one -one remake of the Japanese film Yojimbo, created by cinema legend Akira Kurosawa. John Sturgis's famous The Magnificent Seven is an Old West-style remake of Akira Kurosawa's 1954 film Seven Samurai. And The Mandalorian is hyper-similar to the 1972 Japanese film Lone Wolf and Cub. The film tells the story of a wandering killer for hire who is accompanied by a young child. They travel to different locations, meeting different people, and saving the lives of persecuted villagers. Again, sound familiar? And just in case you still had any doubts about The Mandalorian's fixation on East Asian inspiration, the show gave us this. <laughs> 
Episode 13 was a love letter to samurai films and a culmination of all these underlying themes that the show had been running with. And I know, it seems like we have completely gotten off the rails, but here is how this all links back to my main point. The Mandalorian, at its core, was never meant to be enjoyed as a consistent, serialized narrative. Those random three episodes in the middle of season one, where we see Mando and Baby Yoda just going places and doing things, that's what the Mandalorian is meant to be. Don't get me wrong, the Imperial storyline definitely has an overarching purpose, and Juan Carlo Esposito has all but confirmed that the future seasons will be more linear and answer our questions. But for right now, the Empire hunting Baby Yoda simply serves as a narrative excuse to push Mando from location to location. Mando's mission to find a Jedi is a storytelling tool to keep him on the move in meeting new people. The Mandalorian isn't about a warrior and a child fleeing from the Empire. Tyler Hersko was right, The Mandalorian is a show about nothing which then allows it to be about anything at any time it wants. One episode, we can save a jungle tribe from a mecha, and another episode, we can end a blood feud by slaying a dragon. For so many of us consumers of dramatic fiction, we've been conditioned to expect these connected, ever-building storylines from shows. The first three episodes of The Mandalorian put us in our little safe spaces of thinking that every episode was going to build on the last. And of course, a huge part of this comes from the fact that live-action Star Wars has been building upon the same central story for 40 years. We expected that familiar space operatic progression that had become so ubiquitous with Star Wars, but what we got was episodic gunslinger adventures that completely shirked the traditions of the franchise. We would roll our eyes when Mando got betrayed for the 18th time, or when his ship broke down for the fifth episode in a row keeping him from getting Baby Yoda to where he needed to be. But the reason Mando never succeeds, even in this most recent episode, is because the premise must be maintained. The story is about the journey, not the destination. If Mando succeeded and parted ways with Baby Yoda, the journey would be over. The Mandalorian is less Return of the Jedi and more Samurai Jack. Jack had one goal every episode, return to the past, and defeat Aku. It's right in the intro. Now the fool seeks to return to the past and undo the future that is Aku. And every episode, the samurai would fail and continue his journey. Am I saying that the Mandalorian is perfect? Lord no. What I'm saying is that Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni have worked together to avoid telling a story about a galaxy in peril and instead are storytelling about the people of the galaxy and their personal peril, however unrelated these perils are to each other. The Mandalorian's episodes are meant to be small-scale explorations of the citizens that make up the galaxy and the conflicts that they endure. And sure, not all of these stories hit the mark that they need to, but Star Wars has been so grandiose and existential that these smaller stories come off to many as a nice change of pace. Not to mention that some of fans' favorite aspects of Star Wars have the potential to be explored now in deeply personal ways. Where is your master? Where is Grand Admiral Thrawn? I think Tyler Hersko and myself and many other people were put off by the show simply because of what we expected it to be and what it refused to become. The Mandalorian is still a $100 million show about nothing and the show seeks to make that adherence to nothing matter. I think as consumers of fiction, the sooner we accept The Mandalorian for what it is, the sooner we can appreciate what it's trying to do. Anyway, thank you all for watching to the end. If you like what you heard, like, comment, and subscribe. If you wanna be a real homie, support the channel on Patreon. I'll put a link in the description. As always, it was a pleasure, and I will talk to you all again soon.